Good afternoon. Welcome to UK Column News Take Two. It's now 10 minutes past one. Uh, luckily, it's still the 1st of August 2014. Still a good month for those who have a birthday this month. And uh, well, what were we talking about that was causing a problem? I think it was to do with uh, the situation in Ukraine and Britain's military. We're going to rerun from here so that uh, the uploaded version has all the information. Take us to Ukraine, Mike. Uh, uh, well, we need to start. We need to come back a bit. Yes. There we are. So I apologize for having to start again, but uh, here we go. This is Mark Urban on the BBC reporting that all is not well between the Ministry of War and uh, the military top brass. Uh, he's saying that senior officers in the armed forces uh, and ministers have been at loggerheads about the implications of the Ukraine crisis for Britain's defence. Uh, and uh, he's reporting that, in fact, uh, General Sir Richard Sheriff uh, made some remarks to the uh, House of Commons Defence Committee uh, and that during following his remarks, then Philip Hammond, who was Defence Secretary at the time, uh, was really pretty dismissive about those remarks. And of course, the military concerned that uh, that the political moves to antagonise Russia um, are not could, can't be backed up with military action because we've decimated our militaries pretty systematically. Um, and uh, they're saying they're also saying that uh, the House of Commons Defence Committee, this is, is also saying that events in Ukraine seem to have taken the UK government by surprise. And of course, that's complete nonsense, um, because uh, since the events in Ukraine have been pretty much uh, created by the British government alongside uh, the Europeans, European governments, um, it can't have taken them by surprise. Um, so military brass suggesting that we can't respond to Russia. But of course, um, the key point here, isn't it, is, isn't it that, uh, that uh, it's not Russian aggression that we're having to respond to here, it's uh, NATO aggression that which Russia is responding to? Well, this, this is true. I, I made a comment earlier, which is uh, talking about Russian threat, because that's what our government is pushing forward. But uh, as, as we did say, it's... Uh, obvious to see that NATO now moving right up to the borders of Russia. Uh, we've got um, help from uh, Europe, uh, Britain and the US in destabilizing former Soviet states. And of course, we've, we've produced a big article pointing out that the BBC is up to no good in all of these eastern states, including Ukraine. Uh, but the key point we, I will push at least is the fact that uh, over many years, we've seen a failure of senior officers to actually stand up and be counted over cuts. They appear in the news, uh, usually the newspapers over a couple of days and then they disappear into the background. Uh, we're not seeing uh, resignations. We're not seeing the uh, weight of these officers being brought together to reveal what is really happening and, and has been done to Britain's armed forces. We've got people that the moment they cli climb up the ladder, uh, they're promoted to uh, senior rank, flag rank, they're admirals uh, and generals. Then they're towing the party political line because, of course, they're looking forward to be elevated to sir or lady themselves. So I'm afraid no sympathy at all from uh, UK column to Britain's senior military officers weighed down by uh, gold braid and medals. And most of them, it would appear, still either sat on their backsides or out playing golf uh, whilst the country's military is dismantled. Treason? I think that was your point just yeah, now, it, it, or it, pretty yeah. close to it. Yeah. It's more than incompetence because this is uh, sitting idly by uh, whilst clearly corrupt and very dangerous politicians are now uh, dismantling Britain's defences. So where do, where do we go from this? Well, in the meantime, then, Chatham House, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, really pushing the idea that uh, we've got to increase sanctions in Russia. So we need to stick a big, a, a big stick right into the heart of the bear, harder than ever. Um, they're talking about oil exports. They're talking about uh, uh, how the, the Russian... Well, they're really saying here that the Russian economy, according to the IMF at least, is... is uh, uh, increasingly at risk of recession and they're arguing very strongly that uh, therefore we've got to keep pushing with sanctions in order to push the Russian economy over the edge uh, and a pretty nasty uh, sort of report uh, and perhaps the uh, situation between military and politicians in the UK is what's pushing this um, but they're certainly pretty determined at uh, Chatham House that uh, there should be no 
pull back from the uh, from the economic attack on Russia, um, and uh, well, we. You can imagine where that's going to end up. Yeah, before you take that off screen, Mike, isn't that a creepy picture of those two uh, men? You just you just imagine them. They're all they're wealthy. They've got their suits on. They're just taking the train into Brussels and sitting in the restaurants in the evening. And what are they doing there? Uh, they seem to be planning another war so that a few more hundred thousand people can die is it going to affect them? No. I, f I find this a particularly creepy image. There's well, something about those two. I have to admit, any time I see Van Rompuy uh, in a photograph, the same type of shiver runs up my spine as when I see Tony Blair in a photograph. Yeah. I get the feeling he's the same kind of person. Bedmates, probably. Possibly. Uh, well, let's come in a different direction. Same problem. World War Three, David Cameron style. Um, and in the ring, well, we'd like to see them in the ring. Florence of Arabia versus Putin. And um, uh, this is uh, Rory Stewart. Uh, he's been writing an opinion in the Financial Times. He says in Britain, the Ministry of Defence closed its Russia analysis group in 2010. NATO excises in Europe are a fraction of their size that they were in the 1980s. This is reckless. NATO members should spend at least 2% of output on defence. Uh, many spend less than half that. They should live up to their op obligations and the money should be spent not on pensions or extravagant, extravagant equipment, but on uh, assessment staff, strategic communications, large-scale exercises, standing forces and cyber defence. Nothing less will do. Uh, if we're not to deter a repeat of Mr Putin's actions in Ukraine, then we must address the larger question, what steps are we prepared to take to protect international borders or to support democratic governments that want to ally with Europe? Do we know how to deter aggression from a paranoid and easily provoked nuclear armed regime? Um, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing, isn't it, really? Um, who is this guy? Well, let's remind ourselves. Here he is, Florence of Arabia, the chair of uh, the Defence Select Committee, Bilderberger, Trilateral Commission, EU Council on Foreign Relations and Charity Turquoise Mountain. What's he trained in? Nothing. Uh, spent less than a year in the military. But of course, he is uh, one of the golden boys of the royal family. And here he is now, chair of the Defence Select Committee, um, attempting to dictate policy against this man. And I'm just going to say, whatever your view on Putin, at least he looks like a, uh, a leader. He looks like a premier. Uh, we've got Florence of Arabia. I, I think we should put these two guys in a boxing ring and let them sort it out. And uh, I think I know where my bet's going to go. Yeah. So this is the sort of thing that Florence is involved in. We've had this up before. Um, the European Council on Foreign Relations. Is it my imagination or is that a satanic logo? Make your own mind up on that. Uh, but all of this going on in the background, none of it debated in Britain's Parliament. And unless people understand that this is now where policy is being produced, then of course you're going to be puzzled as to what's actually happening. Here he is, some 16-year-old schoolboy let loose to decide what uh, defence policy should be. And what happens when we let people like this control the country? Well, let's make it even simpler. Uh, this is HMS Invincible, scrapped in Turkey from a couple of years ago. So not even a British company gets that contract? Well, no, good grief. You don't want to help this country. If the agenda is to destroy Britain, then you want it completely destroyed. You don't want to create an industry out of destroying your military. You want other people to make the profit out of that. And uh, here's the Western Morning News, so a good um, southwest of England uh, newspaper with an article saying don't scrap HMS Illustrious, uh, keep her in reserve. So we've got this nonsense about one super carrier which is apparently going to rule the world until it has to go into refit and then oh dear we don't have one. And who is the idiot forming this policy? Well here he is, I'll scrap the carriers, decimate the army and let Florence of Arabia start a war with Russia. That's what an eating education can do, y'all. So is it any wonder? 
Right, change of subject. A new Magna Carta. I will just want to thank Nathan for pointing us at this. Uh, so obviously we've had this particular story up uh, about a month ago. 2015 is the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, as we mentioned in mid-June. David Cameron has suddenly woken up to that and has pledged that school children will be given lessons uh, on Magna Carta. And that, that at the time we asked what kind of lessons. Well, maybe we get a clue. Um, because on the 10th of uh, July, um, the Political and Constitutional Reform Committee released a report entitled A New Magna Carta. And this is a paper setting out the proposals uh, that could be adopted in the preparation, design and implementation of a codified constitution and three illustrative blueprints, a constitutional code, a constitutional consolidation act and a written constitution, which indicate how a codified constitution for the UK could take shape. Now, what this paper does is to limit the scope of the argument very well, so that no matter which of the options that are offered comes to pass, um, we end up pretty much in the same place, a pro-European legal system, pro, uh, you know, a European uh, corpus juris based uh, constitution. Um, so here's the man uh, who is uh, lead chair of the uh, Political and Constitutional Reform Committee, it's Labour MP. Graham Allen, he's MP for Nottingham North since 1987. Uh, now, we mentioned him the other day because he seems to be helping uh, Mickey, who is the, uh, the other Beechwood uh, witness. Yeah. Um, but uh, we'll see what happens with that. However, um, Allen is a proponent of, of so-called constitutional reform. Uh, he supports the idea of independent local government. Uh, he's a proponent of a fully elected House of Lords. In other words, uh, he doesn't really understand, or at least I'm not going to say that he doesn't understand the British Constitution. I'm sure he does, but he certainly doesn't want to see the principles upon which our Constitution was founded continue. Uh, he, and, uh, you know, he, he clearly wants to turn the uh, House of Lords into another whipped uh, House of political parties. In 1995, he wrote the last Prime Minister being honest about the UK presidency. Uh, and he argues in that, uh, that the UK effectively has a presidency. And this is something we've been hinting at recently, uh, because every time you see David Cameron mentioned, um, it's in a kind of presidential style. Uh, but he's arguing that, in fact, the Prime Minister, the position of Prime Minister should be elected as if he was a president, uh, and that this uh, new arrangement should come under the scope of a written constitution. Um, so again, we have the situation where um, because people aren't doing their jobs, and by that I mean the Queen, uh, the Queen isn't doing her job, uh, and uh, we, ha we have a mess, therefore, uh, the tendency then is to bring about alternatives which are not in the best interests of our history and, and our culture and, and the people of this country. Um, so perhaps it's not surprising that this man was chosen to lead the select committee and push forward the constitutional reform agenda. He's 100% behind the notion of a new constitution for Britain along the Euro European model, as far as I can see, of everything being prohibited unless permission is specifically given. Uh, and as I said yesterday, this approach is an absolute anathema to the history of the nation and the constitution and the principles of liberty that the uh, constitution is founded upon. Um, so here he's calling for a new Bill of Rights, and this is a, a, you know, a, a feature of, of the post-2010 rhetoric right across all three political parties. So having written their document then uh, and limited the scope of the discussion, now comes the public co consultation, and the public have until the 1st of January 2015 um, and the, to, to make their representations, and the committee will report on the responses for the public in time for them to be taken in, into account by the next general election. So that's a pretty fast, um, a pretty fast timetable there, and we really got to got to think about this. So um, I just wanted to actually highlight um, a an email I got uh, from Lisa um, regarding the comments that we made yesterday, because I think it's relevant. And she's saying, "Human rights trash individual rights." The principle of human rights is a confidence trick. The idea behind the introduction of so-called human rights is to con the public into believing that human rights are the same as individual rights. They are not. Our traditional individual rights are New Testament based and have taken a long time, centuries, to become enshrined in the English Constitution and consequently, and sorry, and subsequently in the US Constitution and many others around the world. It does not matter whether you're an atheist, Muslim, Jew or anything else. Individual rights and common law give all of us our freedom and equality in law. We should cherish this, fight for this, and not permit these hard-fought rights to be abandoned. 
beware. Once we have all accepted the hu that human rights are a great development and individual rights are all fashioned and fuddy-duddy and don't matter, guess what? Our human rights will inevitably be in conflict with something new that is being developed right now. Community rights. The rights of the collective stroke community. And guess which set of rights will prevail? The community, of course, as represented by slimy crook crooks and creeps, the so-called stakeholders. How can one person stand against a gang? They can't. The community will prevail every time. You have been warned. This is communitarianism. And I absolutely agree with you, Lisa. This is communitarianism coming in uh, via the mechanism of constitutional reform. And, and big society in particular. Well, this is all part of the. Yeah. It's all part of it. And so what I've got to say here, guys, is that there has never been a greater... Uh, need for the British Constitution Group and this campaign is being relaunched today with a new website uh, and a new drive not only to educate the public about what our Constitution represents but to give people the tools to deal with these traitors that we have in Parliament and with that in mind uh, one of the new features of this website is, is forums uh, and these forums are not for discussion because these are not it's not a new discussion group the forums are there um, to, uh, they're organized by county rather than by subject and the idea is that members come on and start getting organized start organizing events local campaigns notify each other of any unlawful activity that's going on in their local areas by government the police and bailiffs um, we need to I'm sorry to say this we need to get people off Facebook in some respects and get people actually talking to each other in local groups and by organizing the forums in the way that we have on the new website uh, you get to see who's in your local area and, and get to work together with them. Now, obviously there's membership fees associated with the BCG and what is there is there's money sitting there at the moment and what's gonna happen with that? Well, we're gonna uh, make some of that available for local groups for, for leaflets, for room hire, for promotional purposes. Uh, we want you to be getting active, getting organized, getting uh, groups set up. Uh, and just I'll just tell you now that the main BCG conference this year is going to be on the 1st of November and that's the day when even more of our sovereignty is passed over to the European Union uh, and uh, detail of the venue and so on the speakers that, that will follow um, and there will be a host of events in the run-up to that. Um, now look, uh, the founding members of the BCG can't do it all, we need you to help. So if you are a BCG member or have been in the past and would like to get involved, please log on to the website. Everybody's log on from the past will, will work now uh, and uh, start getting organized. And if you're not a member, please consider joining and getting involved. Um, we, th there's now a clear timetable from the government for how this constitutional yeah. reform is going to go. We have now know that we've got until basically May next year when the general election comes along We've got to get some momentum back into this campaign and we're asking for your help to do so. I will say on top of that that um, we think it is absolutely vital uh, that people are working together. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your status is. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter what your colour is. Unless we start working together, uh, the criminals that we now have driving the country from Westminster are going to collapse our constitution to form a dictatorship. That is apparent. It's happening very, very quickly. Can we stop it? Yes, we certainly believe that. But what it requires is many, many good people to stop the squabbling and the petty antagonisms and to actually start working together. If you don't believe what's happening, well, this is where it's going to, uh, this is where it's leading. This is in fact happening now. So let's take you to HM Prison Peterborough. Uh, I had the pleasure of a 575 mile round trip in order to have a one hour visit yesterday. This is what welcomes you. This is uh, Sodexo Super Prison in uh, Peterborough, uh, aside from men and women prisoners, of course, it boasts a baby unit. So this is clearly uh, looking after individuals, looking after their best interests. And of course, who did I go to visit? Well, I went to visit child abuse victim and whistleblower Melanie Shaw, uh, locked up in this prison on remand until we believe the 22nd of October, 2014. And as emerged at a recent hearing in Nottingham, members of the public have reported back to us that not one shred of evidence was produced in court against her. 
Here we've got a woman who suffered unbelievable um, abuse, not only from her family, but at the hands of Beechwood Children's Home, run by Nottingham City Council and County Council. Has the state protected her as a whistleblower? Has she been uh, nurtured? Has she been comforted? No, she has been put in HM Prison Peterborough, we believe, to make sure that her evidence against vicious and widespread child abuse and the deaths of many uh, young children does not come into the public domain. So this is the reality of Britain, which David Cameron, of course, Blair, Gordon Brown have been building. Uh, the innocent are put in prison, uh, disappeared in order to shut them up. Well, plenty of money for uh, uh, Sodexo Prison Peterborough. Uh, huge extensions going on. Here we can see the tower cranes um, adding um, roof sections into part of the new building. So money is no problem for prisons. Of course, money is a problem for the NHS or even feeding people. Uh, but if you look at what Theresa May and David Cameron are doing at the moment, uh, now building a gulag of private prisons, totally unaccountable to the public. Uh, and this is where we are all going to end up unless we start to really fight what's happening in Britain. So a few of you commenting that Brian seems fired up today. I'm going to say Brian is very fired up because when I started giving talks on the state of the nation some six or seven years ago, I often used the phrase that it wasn't a joke, it was deadly serious. And now we're starting to see the real proof of that. So it's not enough to be sitting uh, in your comfortable armchair, sending emails and chatting to friends. Uh, we need, particularly in this autumn period, people to really get out there and start to bring this battle to the faces of our politicians. What sort of men, are we, men and women are we dealing with? Uh, well, this is a little leaflet that was sent back to a lady who had actually uh, sent a letter to Vernon Coker, one of the Nottingham MPs. Uh, so she'd uh, pointed out to him that uh, Melanie Shaw had been charged uh, on, on an arson offence. And um, this, is, uh, this is what she got back. She got a little piece of paper from this man with compliments and this is now a matter for the courts. So this is Vernon Coker MP expressing deep concern that a child abuse victim and whistleblower is held in prison um, after speaking out. And of course, that's with no evidence against her. Um, they're asking in the chat box how Melanie is actually. Uh, well, I'm going to say that uh, Melanie was delighted to see both myself and Alex uh, Keynes and um, in the time available, one hour, we were able, I think, to boost her spirits. Um, what is she feeling? She's feeling very down. She's feeling betrayed uh, by people who have failed to support her uh, when she's been brave enough to speak out about child abuse. She's still deeply concerned for her personal safety and she is deeply ashamed of Britain, a nation that now in prisons child abuse victims in order to make sure they don't embarrass the establishment. I could say more, but I'm not going to. It, this will emerge uh, over the coming weeks. But my point is that if you think this is an issue that's just affecting Melanie Shaw, no, it isn't. Any one of us uh, can be hauled in front of a kangaroo court now and imprisoned because the government doesn't like us or like our view. And we'll just bring in the Daily Mail here because, of course, here was the mail. Here's the casual article. Well, there's been a bit of an investigation, 50 allegations of physical and sexual abuse stretching back 30 years. No, no, no. The abuse is still going on. And this wasn't just physical and sexual abuse because uh, witnesses and victims are talking about children dying in significant numbers and many are alleging that children were murdered on site and that Nottingham police under Operation Daybreak are simply not doing their job in investigating the abuse and those alleged murders. 
Can we emphasize this a bit more? I think we can. Uh, we've got here the, the mail reporting uh, on Christopher Spivy, who was arrested at two o'clock in the morning uh, by six um, Essex police officers. Uh, why do you arrest people at two o'clock in the morning? Um, shock and awe. Shock or frighten people, frighten uh, families with this. I believe the Gestapo used to prefer arrests at three o'clock in the morning because people were then in the middle of their deep sleep. Mm. So Essex police, you need to get into the Gestapo handbook because you're obviously not read, read up enough. Uh, but here is somebody claims that he, he, he was involved in uh, uh, social media harassment. And what was this man talking about? Well, he was saying that he did not believe the government's account of the murder of Lee Rigby. And he was starting to talk on his website about the research he'd done, particularly into events that day and video footage. And uh, what then happens, you get your door kicked in at two o'clock in the morning and you're arrested. Um, so this is from the Mail report here. It says the arrest relates to an allegation of harassment via social media. Uh, all of us that use social media, media, just think what that means. Somebody makes an allegation that you've harassed them via social media. You get your door kicked in at two o'clock in the morning. So it's so all on it. He hasn't murdered somebody. He hasn't abused a child. He has written some words on the internet and that justifies you having your door kicked in at two o'clock in the morning this yeah. day, these days. Yeah. And of course, what I'd like to say from this article is once again, the Daily Mail completely missing the point. Uh, there's no proper investigation into what research he did. And uh, they've um, made great play of snide comments so that Chris Spivy is, of course, um, assisted or supported by, by David Icke. Uh, conspiracy theories come in. And um, uh, as far as I can see, they've done their best to uh, try and ridicule this man without asking how can British police, uh, six men come into somebody's house at two o'clock in the morning because there's an allegation that you've harassed somebody via social media. Yeah. This is very, very dangerous stuff unfolding in front of our eyes. It's a shutdown of free speech. Yeah. I mean, so this is, there's, no, there's no libel here. There's no slander here. This is, this is somebody giving a view of, of what he's read, what he's seen, yeah. uh, and, and he's been firmly told to shut up. And yeah. the Daily Mail, rather than protecting his right of free speech, has uh, simply ridiculed him and shouted conspiracy yeah. theory. And This is yeah. the same Daily Mail, of course, that was very happy to publish 11 pages on uh, Common Purpose after being alerted to what uh, political charity Common Purpose was really up to uh, by UK Column. So we wonder if anybody out there might like to look up the journalist who produced this story. I think it's a lady called uh, Stephanie Linning. Uh, we'd like to know a little bit about her background. Is she an 18 year old who was let loose on this story for a bit of fun? Or has she got a little bit more of a connection uh, with the government? If anybody's got some time to do some research, we'd like to know a bit more about her. And uh, let's have a look at this lady. Let's bring her face into the public domain so that we know who is producing this absolute, absolutely crass reporting. OK, moving on. Uh, Resolution Foundation here finally catching up with what we've been saying for quite some time, that uh, people who are um, holding mortgages and over leveraged to the hilt are in serious trouble at the moment. They're saying uh, the UK is entering a, entering a period in which interest rates are expected to rise again with the first moves potentially coming later this year. Having insufficiently dealt with the debt overhang, this leaves the UK economy vulnerable to even modern uh, increases in interest rates. Our modelling suggests that even, this is their modelling, uh, that even a relatively benign unwinding of today's emergency interest rate position, allied with the anticipated growth in house household incomes, has the potential to roughly double the number of households facing some form of repayment problem by 2018. And they produce a graph here showing um, how, in fact, since interest rates crashed down to half a percent, um, the number of people in distress with regard to their mortgage repayments uh, is, uh, has gone up. Uh, correspondingly and uh, and of course it's going to continue going up and I think one of the things to highlight here is that that graph shows quite clearly that 
that this period of, in the last four or five years of low interest rates is an absolute abnormality with regard to what you might expect to see uh, with interest rates. And in fact, if we only go back, uh, you know, 20 years, we're looking at interest rates in the in the 10 to 15 percent region, which of course means that mortgage rates will be in the 15 to 20 percent region, completely unaffordable for the majority of people who are over leveraged and uh, are going to lose their homes uh, unless we deal with the banks. We've said it many times. Um, let's move on. Uh, the human genome, the UK is to become the world's number one in DNA testing. Uh, and I'm afraid I've got to look at this with a view to what the, how the government is uh, handling um, personal information and data at the moment. So, so the government absolutely making an investment here, I believe, into big data, um, where they're going to put 300 million pounds investment into uh, DNA research. They say in order to transform how diseases are diagnosed and treated. I say it's in order to transform how insurance companies operate and how they make use of uh, big data in order to uh, appropriately um, charge you for li uh, life insurance and also, um, well, and also decide how you're going to get any kind of insurance policy actually. So uh, insurance is only one potential application for this data, but in my opinion this is all about uh, uh, profiling the population and nothing whatsoever to do with the benefit of mankind and sorting out our medical problems. Well, perhaps we ought to add to that. If, um, if you haven't been into a prison, I um, encourage you to do it. Find a prisoner to visit and go and have the experience yourself. Uh, but uh, one of the things that Mike and I will tell you is that uh, when you go into many prisons now, you're going to get biometric data taken. So you're going to have your photograph taken. You're also going to have fingerprints scanned. And it's a very simple system because if you don't agree to the taking of the biometric data, you don't get in to see the prisoner. Uh, but don't worry, private companies say they only hold that biometric data uh, for the time that you visit the prison. And when you don't visit the prison anymore, uh, of course, that data is destroyed or sold for a profit. Well, I mean, the DVLA is selling data hand over fist at the moment. And in fact, uh, somebody uh, sent me an email earlier today making an allegation that, that, that individuals within the DVLA are rumoured, shall we say rumoured, um, to have been uh, selling personal information on people in particular areas um, to foreign intelligence services. So, uh, uh, you know, this whole notion of big data and our data is protected by the government because of the Data Protection Act, it's a load of nonsense. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and finally, just, just turn away if you're of a weak disposition. Yes, uh, but this is this is quite uh, an interesting little development because one of the fascinating things, or one of the things that's fascinated me recently, is that, that we keep seeing these press releases from government uh, about how David Cameron has visited this place and he said this, or D George Osborne has visited that place and he said that, and there doesn't seem to be anywhere obvious to go to uh, to find out where they're visiting. Uh, in fact, the mainstream media here today complaining that uh, not even they are able to get this information anymore. Um, so George Osborne is about to head out um, on a national tour paid for by the taxpayer. But basically, nobody's going to get any advance notice of where he's going. So you can't turn up and ask any questions or shove a camera in his face or, you know, do the normal sort of democratic things that you might want to do in a, in a democracy. Instead, uh, his, his visits are completely secret but for his own personal safety, I'm sure, and security. But they're completely secret and apparently not even the media are going to know. So all we're going to get, the only evidence we're going to get of any of these public meetings is the official government press release that comes out afterwards. No independent uh, verification of what was said or any, you know, any, any questions that were asked from the audience that might have put them in, in a difficult position because it'll only be the sanitised government press release that anybody gets to see from now on, it yeah. seems. Another politician who looks particularly vacant, you look at the face, you look at the eyes, there's, there's, there's actually, what is there? Nothing. Evil. Yeah. Um, well, let's end with 71 days, and that's the uh, total length of time that Robert Green has been under house arrest at his home in Warrington, England. His crime, well, his crime is to try and protect children uh, such as Holly Gregg from uh, abusers. Um, oh, sorry. So Robert, another person who uh, uh, has been through the court system, has been put in prison. Uh, no, no evidence, of course. Um, ha ha 
originally held on remand. Now he's under house arrest, reporting to Warrington Police once every day. He's done it for 71 days. What's his crime? Well, there isn't one. It's here, isn't it? The yep. dictatorship. We are a fraction away. We're at the tipping point of whether this country stays free or moves into a dictatorship. And uh, UK Column's going to end our uh, transmission for this week for a much needed break by saying um, we need all of you now to start uh, pulling together to expose what is really going on because we can see the rules and regulations coming in ever more quickly. Uh, can we stop it? Yes, but we need people to actually do things instead of talking and enjoying the uh, programme really. Indeed, right. Uh, six o'clock tonight, Doom Watch variant 36, because we're not allowed to call it an episode. Uh, variant 36, Marcus Allen from Nexus Magazine. Uh, but as well as that, uh, apparently we're going to have uh, Gr Dr. Graham Downing coming on to talk about the, uh, I believe, about the Ebola uh, uh, epidemic, inverted commas. Mm. Uh, so he'll be on for a short time as well. Uh, in other news, Carl Lentz is going to be back in the country in the next couple of weeks. And straight after this programme, we're showing a little advertisement for that. So if you're interested in going to one of the talks that Carl Lentz is talking, please stay tuned for 30 seconds or so after this programme. Uh, and as Brian said, we will be back on the 18th of August. Um, the, the live stream will be uh, playing while uh, technology permitting, assuming it doesn't all fall over at some point. Um, over the two weeks that we're away. So uh, if you want to direct people to it, please do. There'll be nothing new on there over those two weeks, of course. Um, but if you know anybody that hasn't seen the kind of, kind of stuff that we're pushing out, please direct them to it. And we'll see you on the 18th. Uh, just one final announcement before we go. Um, somebody was kind enough to alert us to the fact that the BBC has now decided it needs to get its ideology into India. And the BBC is apparently starting to um, start trends on social networks, social media in India, and the subject is sex education. So the BBC is now targeting India. Uh, we know what's going to be done. The heterosexual family is to be targeted. Liberalism is to be brought in. So if you have relations, friends, colleagues who are Indian or have co connections with India, please can you alert them to the fact that India is now becoming the focus of this vile uh, dark uh, media and programming that's uh, largely been responsible for a lot of destruction of society in UK. So that's the title, it's Sex Education, India after thousands of years of a very proud history and uh, cultural identity apparently needs the BBC to tell uh, Indian parents uh, how to properly sex educate their children. You couldn't make it up and we don't, it's true. Uh, we look forward to you joining us on the 18th. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye.